Alrighty, I guess let's get started. Um, so <laughs> that's me. I'll start by pointing to the slides. Uh, um, I'm Ben Oshran. I uh, have multiple hats, which seems suitably appropriate for this session. Um, one of which is, is part of this thing called Sparkle Cow Group, which is uh, a small partnership of people who like to name things funny. Um, and our logo is awesome. Uh, but I also uh, have a role at UC Berkeley. Uh, you'll notice the name is the same and the reference ID is the same, but the title is different. Um, that will make more sense at the end of the presentation. Um, and so while I'm really here as a historical cow person, which is as fun to say as it is to hear, um, this is actually really about work being done at UC Berkeley. Um, and so with that confusing disclaimer that didn't really disclaim anything, we can move on off the title slides. Um, so identity match, what is it? Uh, so higher ed tends to like to think of itself as special, and in many ways it is. Um, in this, this is one specific way where we start talking about the multiple systems of record that lots of institutions <laughs> have. Um, so typically, when we talk SORs, we're talking about your student system, your HR system, your guest management system, your affiliate system, your alumni system the system for friends of the gym, for library patrons, et cetera. Any of these sources can be at a university authoritative sources of identity. Obviously, it varies. Some schools will have everything in one system, but that's not necessarily the typical case. Um, and so what we end up needing to do is identify where we've got records from the, for a single person from multiple sources so we can properly manage access to resources. And here we talk about some of the example scenarios where you can have an individual come in through multiple sources. And it's really the same person, but the SORs don't know that because you know, the student system doesn't really care about the HR system and so on and so forth. So you know, even students alone can end up in three different systems without trying very hard. Uh, they might apply via some sort of commercial application. Then their information may or may not directly transfer to the registrar in a way that's directly consumable. So they enroll via the registrar. Uh, eventually, they graduate or they've completed enough work that the alumni office considers them alumni so they can be hit up for donations, regardless of whether or not they actually have a degree. Uh, so now they're being tracked through whatever the alumni relations system is. Um, employees, of course, hired through HR. Maybe they were a student before they were hired. Maybe they're an employee who enrolls in courses, shows up in the student system. And then guests and affiliates, which you know, is an NP complete problem for them. Uh, so we've got these multiple systems of records, and, and in order to make sure that people only get one net ID and that it gets associated with the privileges that they're actually entitled to, which of course is a whole separate problem, uh, we need to determine, are you the human kin that we already know? So, and that's just one example name that I pulled out of the Berkeley directory where I think there's like eight people with some variation of the name. Um, so what we see is in order to solve this problem, there are multiple approaches that folks have done. And uh, I guess maybe there would be an interesting poll in the room that we could do here, or interesting being a relative term, um, of what institutions are represented here and what they've done. But you, you tend to see a common theme emerge. So variation one is you've got some form of identity registry-like thing, the central repo that has identities for everybody at the institution. And it receives a bunch of batch feeds, usually. Maybe it's something more advanced. Um, and the registry itself is responsible in one way, shape, or form to determine whether or not somebody is somebody that they already know. Um, a second variation would be the match is done uh, by the system of record uh, before a record is sent along to the registry. So the system of record might call out to a standalone match application and say, hand me an identifier for this person, and if it's a person that's already known, they'll get back an identifier for an existing person. Um, and then there's a, a variation on that where it's actually done before the system of record, and there are a handful of schools that do this I'm aware of, where uh, if a person basically sets up, anybody can enroll and, and get a, a credential on campus, and so if you want to, for example, apply to the university or uh, imply as an employee, you actually just get yourself a NetID that has no privileges attached to it and then use that to kick off your, uh, your application process. So in a sense, the human is the match engine uh, because presumably if you come back, you might remember that you have a NetID, uh, uh, although 
you probably still need some sort of systematic check behind the scenes because people don't always have perfect memories when it comes to this sort of thing. Uh, maybe just a quick round of hands. You know, for folks who represent a school or an institution that's doing something like this now, whether you're using a commercial product or whether you've got some Perl scripts that date back to 1984. Um, you know, or earlier. Yeah, oh, yeah, earlier. Wait, when did Perl? Perl. Uh, well, we can be Cobol then. Whatever. Cobol, yeah, yeah, Cobol. Um, so yeah, let's let's just maybe lock down the first three here. So uh, who's got something that looks something like variation one? All right. Uh, and who has something that looks something like variation two? Just answer. <laughs> uh, and uh, who has variation two A? Oh. <laughs> All right. We have, we'll have to hear the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll follow up on this later. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, let me ask: Is there something that's that's not actually represented on here that you do? Uh, always interested in edge cases that we haven't previously. Oh, sorry. Sure. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. What is it? We match up uh, um, the identities of uh, just about every identity federation out there. Plus all the potential guest IP. That scales? No. <laughs> <laughs> and it leaves you it leaves you to hugely compute. <laughs> as they can now enter a document uh, with identity one and then go back to the system with identity two and hey my content is wrong. It's kind of correct. So it's almost not a match. Yeah. No, in yeah, sorry, uh, that's a, a fine example where the matching goes wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's okay. Anyway, so before we end up even with more scary examples, I'll just keep going. Uh, so, um, so regardless of the variation that we're talking about, we tend to see similar considerations here, which is a lot of it comes down to the quality of the inbound attributes, right? How good is the data that your system of record collects, vets, and sends to you? Um, and then a lot of it revolves around business process, and we can talk a little bit about this here, although. We're also talking a little bit about software technology. How are ambiguous matches handled or fuzzy matches? So if somebody comes in and you don't have enough information to really identify whether they're new or not, what's your process around that? Is it resolved by a single person in central IT somewhere or in the identity group who knows what they're doing and how to resolve, how to resolve these issues and has access into the underlying system of record data? Does it get punted back to the system of record owner themselves? Does it just get dropped into a bit bucket and nobody ever resolves it? Um, uh, so business process, issue, business process issues fit around this regardless of which of these variations you end up having, although obviously there's some variations. So let's talk a little bit about uh, where identity match fits in. And I bet this is going to be not super readable. Go figure out what I do with the pointer. Um, so this, let's just talk a little bit back here. So this is basically a workflow for how identity match typically happens. And there's a couple pieces here. Um, so if we start at the top, uh, the system of record adds a new person. And this is, again, the, the typical onboarding right, where you've got a new employee or a new, new applicant or whatever. And then depending on how you integrate, or maybe both ways, um, a couple of different flows can happen. So in flow number one going down here, the system of record notifies the identity management system, which then performs the reconciliation somehow and, uh, and may or may not get an ambiguous result. Uh, the other mechanism is which a system of record directly requests the match happen uh, and gets a result. Uh, and then depending on how things flow from there, um, so if your requesting system is interactive, you do something like, uh, if it's a fuzzy match, uh, sorry, this is the ambiguous match, uh, or fuzzy match or potential match list, if, it's, uh, if the requesting system is capable of handling interactive resolution, you can present a set of choices back to the, uh, the requester, assuming there's a human there, and then make, um, they can do a resolution, or it can go to a uh, reconciliation manager type person whose job it is is to do that if it's not, uh, if it's not interactive. Uh, if you do have a canonical match, uh, then you can, i.e., it matches exactly to one person or to no people at all, i.e., create a new person, uh, then either you um, 
uh, attach. The, so if it's not a new person, you may want to attach some new attributes about that SOR to the existing person record. Uh, but if it is a new person, then you need to assign some sort of reference identifier, um, which I'll get to in a second, um, and then uh, notify the requester of that reference identifier somehow. Uh, and this little sign <coughs> over here, just depending on which flow of the bug we started off with. So a reference identifier is just a little bit of terminology to it's pretty much what it sounds like. To, to represent a, a unique identifier for a person as far as the match system is concerned, whatever that match system is, whether it's a registry, whether it's some standalone thing, or whatever. Um, it may be some other identifier that you also use. It could be your NetID, probably, preferably not. Uh, it could be some other internal identifier that you use, or it could just be internal to the match engine itself. Uh, but whatever we're talking about there, um, in some way, shape, or form, it's, it's a reference identifier. Then in terms of more kind of the, the technical components as we rehash old Cypher slides, uh, this is more stuff than we'll talk about, but you can see all the way at the top of the green section here, this is our identity match box. And uh, ooh, identity match box, like those little room cards we used to play with. Um, and so you can see it might be connected to an identity registry, or it might be connected via, say, some sort of API layer or something else. Uh, this is not designed to represent your architecture, but you know many potential architectures. Um, and so here's your system record. It sends some data in, and then either it goes to the identity registry, which calls out to the match engine, and then goes back and does whatever it's going to do, or the system of record calls directly to the identity match engine, gets an answer back, and then it goes into the registry, and then that goes off and does whatever it's going to do. Um, so that's roughly where, every, where the, the pieces fit together. Um, and uh, and so. You know, we started talking in the Cypher land about uh, APIs as a way of making things better and, e and, and more decoupled and easier to work with. Uh, and so ID Match was one of the early cases, actually, of uh, one of these what we call Cypher APIs um, as a means to make services and, and data more accessible in a straightforward way uh, and more decoupled. Um, so uh, the ID match are part of the Cypher APIs. I won't talk about those too much because Keith will be talking about those tomorrow at 10 a.m. in huh, which room? Would it be? I bet it's this room where, uh, uh, where you won't see the light of day until Wednesday afternoon. Um, and we'll talk. Uh, Keith will talk a little bit more about the APIs in general. So I'm just going to focus on the ID match API at this point. Um, it's JSON over REST because that's trendy in what we do today. Um, and it basically accepts a bundle of attributes with the goal of obtaining a reference identifier. Uh, we're currently at version one. Uh, it's evolved quite a bit with a fair number of use cases. So at this point, we're pretty convinced that functionally it conveys what it needs to convey. Uh, but <laughs> we'll probably be evolving it to a version two because it sort of doesn't look like any of the other Cypher APIs at the moment, or maybe not. That's not the right way to phrase it. It doesn't look like our goal for how the API should all look. And so we'll be we'll be tweaking representations and that kind of thing, but the, the core functions of what can be accomplished with the API are likely to remain fairly stable. Uh, and since we all enjoy reading tiny print uh, with lots of curly brackets, this is basically what a transaction looks like. Um, so up in the URL, we've got a put request. Uh, so you think you should think of this in terms of the system of record making a request. Um, so what it's doing is it's putting a bundle of its attributes uh, under some prefix, followed by a label for the UR, for the SOR, which in this case is the student system or SIS, followed by an identifier that uniquely identifies this person as far as the system of record knows it. So 9711948. Or three is the student identifier for this person. And you can see we've got a bundle of attributes, including uh, a name, a date of birth, a national identifier, which who knows what this is, and a mobile telephone number, which is either a US number or I forget what country code 81 is. But um, uh, you, you get the idea. Uh, this is just an example. This is not the canonical set of attributes that you need to send. Theoretically, you can send any of the attributes that are defined in the Cypher core schema or any of your own attributes. The reality is, though, when you're dealing with identity match, there's only a handful of attributes that you probably have enough of to send in the first place. So you know, maybe email address goes on this list, and maybe some form of physical address or something. But most likely, it's not going to get terribly more complicated from there. 
So you send off a request, and you know it's RESTful JSON, so you get an answer back. Uh, and here's three different examples of responses. So the first one is a 200 OK, basically saying, I found a person for you. This person matches your, your requested person <laughs> already. They exist. Uh, that's distinct from a 201 created, which says, there was no such person before I've created them. Uh, effectively, a 200 and 201 are the same answer as far as a client is concerned and should basically be treated the same. Uh, there's probably no reason that a client needs to know the difference between the two. Uh, here you can see a variation in the response, though. The created is just returning a reference ID. The OK is returning the reference ID plus a couple of other identifiers. Uh, there are some variations for optional additional things you can send along in a response, which are largely for convenience purposes, right? So uh, if I know the net ID, why not send it along? Yeah. So yes. that's actually tell you what it used to do the match. So the API doesn't have a way to convey that for the most part. There's a description field that you can use to put sort of a human readable comment, especially for a scenario of a, of a fuzzy match, uh, to help give guidance to whoever's trying to resolve it. But there's no, at the moment, there's no programmatic way to say, here's the fields we did, and here's what matched and, and didn't. Um, it was discussed a little bit, but I think right now there's not a use case that requires it. It's kind of complicated to figure out how to convey that in a way that makes sense. But if you have a use case for it, we should, uh, you know, <laughs> we should talk later. Um, and so the last one here is 404 not found at the, at the bottom, which indicates there was no person uh, <laughs> who um, matched who you sent. Now, uh, a 201 and a 404 would never actually happen in as a result of the same transaction. Uh, so if I go back uh, a bit, you see this is a put request. A put is effectively a read-write operation that says, here's a bundle of attributes. I want an identifier. If you change the put to a post, it becomes a search operation, which basically says, is there anyone who matches these attributes? Um, mm -hmm. And so in the post version, you would get back a 404 not found because it's a read-only operation, uh, as opposed to the put, which would generate a 201 created because it's a read-write operation. And then uh, here's a 300, which, uh, again, becomes decreasingly readable as the amount of data increases. But uh, basically, uh, what you get is a match request identifier, which in this slide is all the way at the top left, 1009. Um, and that's just a, a, a reference handle, effectively, that says you submitted some attributes, and this is the internal identifier should you need to respond to refer to that request again. And then a, a, a list of candidates. And there's effectively two candidates in here um, that you can see. This is simplified a little bit, so it would fit on a slide. But you can imagine with the candidates, you could actually have multiple role information attached to a single candidate. You could probably expect to see more than two candidates coming, coming back, et cetera. You'll notice each of the candidates has a reference ID and a confidence score. The API doesn't say what the confidence score means, other than it should be 0 to 100, with 100 being most confident. Uh, it's, again, just a hint to help a resolving system figure out what's more likely the right person as far as the match engine is concerned. Uh, it's up to an implementation to, to figure out how to come up with a score there. And that's, that's basically it. I mean, if you go through, there's a link to the wiki page at the, at the end of the, the slide deck. If you read through the uh, increasingly long document in the wiki, you'll see there's quite a few more kind of detail-oriented things related to this, such as how do you manage attributes after a match has actually occurred? So if somebody changes their name and comes back later, you want to be able to match them against the new name. Uh, and so there's a way of dealing with that. But uh, for purposes of just a general overview, uh, that's, that's probably good enough. So that's the API. Um, boy, wouldn't it be fun if we had something that actually implements that API? And uh, well, lo and behold, we do. We do have that. Um, so naming projects is annoying. And this one's no different. Uh, so the, the third name for this project is ZRMatch. And uh, the Z and the R stand for Za Reconcila. So you can, you can tell we need some work here. Um, we're, we're all queued up for our fourth name. Um, uh, but that's the name for now. Uh, and basically what we ended up developing, we being uh, at Berkeley, is a Postgres-based identity match implementation. And for those of you who were in San Diego last year, you're probably wondering, wait, didn't you guys talk about something completely different last year? Um, and if you didn't show up, that's 
fine. Just pretend I didn't say that. Uh, but if you did, the, the long story short is um, if you're writing an ID match engine, don't store all your data in memory and then build a new database engine. Um, turns out that's a lot of work, and you end up with a lot of bugs and perhaps a lot of code that we didn't need to write. So as we were working through the backlog of issues, we were trying to figure out how to handle with the original implementation. It occurred to us that what we were actually doing was, well, you've got a large data set of people, um, and you want to search them. There are tools for this, right? Right? There are these database engines, and there's a language that you can use called SQL or SQL that will perform these searches for you. So we did a, a, a quick and dirty proof of concept uh, of, well, what if we were going to do that? Um, and uh, after a little bit of searching, it became clear that Postgres is actually a pretty appealing database product uh, to do this on. Um, so in general, you know, any database can search a bunch of records based on your query string. Um, and, and of course, there are multiple free options. It doesn't necessarily need to be Postgres, although it certainly helps that it's open source. Uh, my personal uh, analysis of Postgres is that it is awesome, and if I were going to write a database server, it would look like Postgres. Um, that's not necessarily how you should really base your decisions. And so the real reason that we ended up with Postgres is this thing called the fuzzy stir match extension, which actually ships as part of the standard distribution, although it's not actually enabled by default. Um, and it provides a set of routines, some of which you can find in other database engines. Uh, but there's this one Levenstein, 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 Distenstein, Levenstein distance matching. Uh, and the, the dumb version of what distance matching is, is if you imagine, say, a string where you transpose two letters in that string, that has a distance of two, because two characters are out of place in the string. And so this is basically a way of measuring that kind of transposition, which turns out to be a really useful thing to do when you're doing identity match type operations. Uh, there is actually a similar extension for MySQL, which is not distributed as part of it, if I remember correctly. Uh, we didn't end up looking at that. Um, and there's actually some other stuff in Postgres that we're going to look at for additional enhancements down the road uh, that make it pretty appealing. The nice thing, of course, is since it's an open source thing, even if you're not running Postgres and you want to run this, this engine, you don't have to pay a gazillion dollars for a license for it. You can basically treat it as a black box that's isolated from everything else that just supports uh, ID match. Um, or if you're feeling brave and want to try to port it to another database, more power to you. Uh, in theory, that can happen. Uh, but Oracle. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Oracle specifically does not appear to have some of the extensions that we need. Uh, I would actually say MySQL is plausible. Oracle would probably require a fair amount of customization, which we'll just leave it at that. Um, oh, and also Postgres, I think, if I remember correctly, traces its roots back to Berkeley, um, uh, as does pretty much everything, apparently. So, so there was that nice kind of thing. So, you know, ZR match really just looks like this. It's a layer of PHP, and people who know me lo know I love to rant about Java. So it's not a rant against Java. I'm happy to do a rant against Java later if people want. Uh, but the reason we chose PHP was it was simple to mock up. Um, there's really very little code. It's probably a few hundred lines. I mean, like, maybe a little more than that, but it, it's like four meaningful files and some meaningless files. Uh, there's not a lot of code there. You could probably, if you really love Java that much, uh, re-implement it in about six hours. Um, and if you really wanted to do it in, say, C, probably about 62 hours. It would be about an hour to do the work and 61 hours to debug all the segmentation faults you're getting. Uh, but point being, there's not a lot in that, that middle blue box there where it says the R match, uh, which is a completely different shade of blue. Wow, that's interesting. Um, so basically what this stuff is, is it's a, it's a utility that, that takes inbound API requests from that uh, format that you just saw, and then based on your configuration, converts them to SQL, looks at the answers, converts them back to the API, and that's it. All the hard work is done by the database because, you know, there's a bunch of smart people working on that database server who know how to properly optimize searches. Um, and so why not let them do that, that work? Now, that said, uh, one size does not fit all. So it's not like you can just download ZR match, load a bunch of data into it, and go. Uh, the issue being that your data probably doesn't look like our data. Um, so for example, you, if you get social security or some sort of national identifier, you probably get the whole number, whereas we get five digits. Um, similarly, we don't necessarily get complete dates of birth. 
Um, and so there are variations as to why you can't just drop and go, but rather you need to, to contemplate how you treat what your attributes are. Um, and so conceptually, we've got at least five types of search types that can help you with that. Uh, the first two are actually implemented. The third one will be implemented real soon now, and then we can talk about the other two in a second. Uh, but exact match is a pretty straightforward thing. Smith equals Smith. Uh, there's no attempt whatsoever in terms of figuring out, did you make a typo? That's where something like distance matching comes in. And you can see a couple of examples there, the first one being a simple typo where presumably somebody you know, typed the characters in the wrong order, and so it becomes Synth instead of Smith, but it's pretty clearly the same person. And then the second one being the, the date and the, the month being swapped. Now, what's interesting is the API actually specifies how the date needs to come across, which is in ISO format, which basically means year, month, day. So there's no actual ambiguity from our standpoint is that March 2nd or February 3rd, it's March 2nd on the left and February 3rd on the right. Um, but that doesn't mean somebody typing in the date didn't get it backwards. Um, and so you can still do distance matching based on dates. As of right now, dates are just strings. So we don't try to treat them any, in any other way. Uh, so we do the same sort of distance check on Smith and on the date. Um, and that's that. Uh, so substring matching will be added pretty quickly from uh, pretty soon, pretty quickly, pretty shortly from now, soon. Uh, and you can see a couple of examples here. And that first one, what's actually going on is a tokenization where you say, well, the first name is Anna, and Marie was a middle name. And that kind of got stuck in, so we don't want to actually match on that middle name. So we'll tokenize on the space, and we'll only treat the first blob of characters that we got back as the string to be matched. The second one uh, is a first three example where we say we're only actually going to look at the first three characters of the name because we figured that's good enough for cases where somebody might type in a lot more or they might stop typing. Uh, and there are a couple of different scenarios where sort of doing, say, three characters and first name is actually a pretty beneficial search type for certain campuses with certain types of data. Uh, again, not necessarily for everybody. So we'll have that real soon now. Uh, dictionary is interesting, and, and I hope to get to it pretty quickly. Um, so this is the concept of John versus Jonathan. So you could see a substring of two would catch that, but not a substring of three. Um, and if it were Jack and Jonathan, well, that wouldn't work at all. Well, I guess some substring of one, but I'm not sure how useful that is. And then we could probably talk about Jerry and Gerald or the other Jerry as ways of you know, frustrating the substring of one search even. So the idea of a dictionary search is to basically assemble names that are equivalent. Uh, Liz and Elizabeth being another good one where the first n characters won't match. Um, and basically be able to do a search query that looks up terms in the dictionary if you can configure it for that attribute. Um, and so this is actually another thing that Postgres does well. If you have a dictionary of terms, you can basically generate queries that will treat them equivalently. And so that's probably how we'll implement this. Uh, populating the dictionary will be kind of interesting. <laughs> Um, uh, there are some dictionaries of names that I believe are licensed sufficiently open enough that we can take them and, and use them, uh, but there's still a little bit of detail to be worked out there. Uh, this is also where internationalization issues become really interesting, right? So this isn't substitute out the string when rendering an error message. This is, all right, give me your dictionary of Chinese similar names. And I'm not sure how that would work at all in this context. Um, uh, although I'm interested to figure it out, and, and hopefully at some point we can get to that. Um, it, you know, it could plausibly be just as simple as having language-specific dictionaries that you can choose which one to load in and run, uh, but that'll be an interesting problem to solve. Uh, so that's dictionary, and then the last one here is Soundex. Um, do people already know what Soundex is, mostly? Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, it's basically a way of doing searches for things that sound similarly, and it's very popular in LDAP contexts, for example. And there's, under the hood, there are ways of figuring out how words sound alike, which we won't get to uh, here. There's an interesting question as to whether or not this is actually a useful thing for an identity match type operation. It may just generate too many false matches. Uh, but it's also trivially easy to support if your database supports a Soundex search. So probably we'll add it, but it's, I think, still of questionable value. So these are the types of searches. And it's plausible we'll add to this over time, uh, but these are the ones we've identified so far. Um, then we've got this concept of search modifiers. 
Uh, and so this is, well, you know, you saw on the previous slide, let's jump to the second one where we've got Smith, but you may have, you know, your really legacy system that puts everything in all caps because lowercase hadn't been invented yet. Um, or you've got, uh, versus your modern ERP, which can actually handle mixed case. Um, and then also, you know, up above, we've got examples of dates with and without hyphens, although it turns out that's actually a bad example uh, because, as I mentioned, the wire protocol actually specifies how dates need to cross. Um, so we've got modifiers that allow you to assert that certain attributes are alphanumeric. Uh, so in that case, we would ignore the hyphens, or case sensitive, or case insensitive, actually, in which case we'd ignore, uh, we'd actually treat those as the same. Uh, and then we also now have this concept of null equivalence. So if somebody types in all zeros as, an, as a social security number or national identifier, well, you don't really want to match on all zeros because that's probably going to generate a lot of false matches if you get that much garbage data coming in. Uh, and so the, the match engine will recognize that and needs to be treated as a null. Uh, and then another example would be where they put in a blank space for you know, a name that they should have actually just typed in the name. So all the stuff I just talked about is completely configuration driven. Um, and yes, it's a configuration file, but at least it's not XML. Uh, it turns out we're currently doing this in INI format, which I'm not proud of, uh, but PHP makes it particularly easy to do this. And the goal, I think, is actually to ultimately migrate this entirely into the database itself so that you can have a nice GUI in front of it to do the actual configuration work. Um, but this is, you know, basically slightly better than proof of concept code. So for now, you get to edit an INI file. Um, and so this is just a quick excerpt of some of it. Uh, so here we define some attributes. The zero match is based on two things. First, you define some attributes. And then secondly, you define how you want them to work together. So this just defines a name, and, or actually a last name, and a date of birth. And so you know, we'll walk down through some of these things. Uh, description is just an arbitrary thing to help you remember what this thing is. A uh, column matches the exact column in the database that holds this attribute. And it's specifically written that way so that over time it can become auto-generated. Um, the idea being you don't have to come up with a column name, but you say, I've got this attribute that's coming across the wire, and it can auto-generate this name from that attribute. Now, the wire version of that attribute is the next thing there. We've got name, colon, family, and that actually corresponds to the cipher core schema for representation of the last name. Um, and then we've got this thing called group, and so that allows you to say have two names. We can accept an official name and a preferred name or something. Um, that's probably not the best example, but you get an idea. You get the idea. Um, and here we say it's not case sensitive, uh, which might actually be the default. I can't remember. Um, and then we say, well, how are you allowed to search this attribute? So you're allowed to do an exact search on it, and you're allowed to do a distance search on it. But for distance, we're only going to allow a distance of two. Again, just thinking in simple terms, that would be one transposition. Um, then for date of birth, you know, this is very, very similar stuff. Uh, here, this one is alphanumeric, um, which actually, arguably, the last name should be also. Uh, and again, we allow an exact search and, uh, and a distance of two. So a typical installation would probably have somewhere between five and 10 of these, depending on which attributes you actually can collect for matching. Then what you need to do is tell the engine, based on your data set, how do I treat these attributes? Now, in the ideal world, the engine would be smart enough to look through your data and figure out this stuff by itself. But I mentioned this is like four PHP files. So you know, give it a few years, and then once the machines come and take over, we'll probably have that kind of intelligence. In the meantime, you have to extract it from whoever the person is on your campus who has all this business intelligence embedded in their head from 20 years of resolving these matches. And they can probably write this out for you in about three minutes. Um, so first, we've got canonical matches. And so if any one of these sets, and the set label doesn't matter. It's just a unique label for that particular set. Um, and if you're not familiar with PHP, uh, sorry, with INI uh, notation, it basically says, I've got this thing called set one, and it's an array. And so put these three things in the first array, and put those four things in the second one. Um, and so here in this first one, if we've got a system of record label, and a system, so HR, SIS, whatever, and we've got a system of record identifier, <coughs> that long string of numbers, and a last name, and they all exact match. So when you're doing a canonical match, everything is an exact match. Um, then that's an exact match. And then the second one says, if a social security number, a first name, a last name, a date of birth match, then it's an exact match. Now, what's interesting here is in the current implementation, 
if both of those match on the same pass and generate two different candidates, it's no longer a canonical match. It will actually drop to a potential match at that point. Effectively, what's happened is it's violated your rule for a canonical match by coming up with two. And so what is the right thing to do? Well, you could stop after the first one, but probably the right thing to do is say, ooh, something went wrong. Here are two potential matches. Um, so that's the canonical match configuration. The potential match configuration looks uh, like this. And you'll notice it's sort of the same, but sort of not the same. Here we actually start saying what types of searches are valid for this for each set. So in that first example, an exact social first name, last name, and a distance match on date of birth is a potential match. And then the second one is the same thing, but with distance applying to SSN instead of date of birth. And then the third one says, if I've got an exact social security match, an exact date of birth match, and nothing else, the name's mismatch, uh, it's a potential match. Actually, the names could still match if you got that far, but I'm not sure you get that far. So any of those will generate a potential match. And again, we run through all of them and, and marshal the results together uh, based on the attributes that came in. Um, so that's, that's basically what ZR match is and does. Um, uh, I've got some performance numbers, but go ahead. Nielsen. Why would you want to, in the previous slide, why would you want to do an uh, exact match Why, where a distance match with value 0 would be the exact same thing? Not exactly. Value 1, sorry. No, uh, yeah, distance match 1 is not the same thing. It's not the same thing as an exact match. Right. right. A right. distance match of 1 will basically allow one error somewhere in the string. <laughs> Okay, so distance zero is an exact match. Yeah, distance zero is exact. Okay. Why, why not do uh, for uh, distance zero di uh, distance matches instead of the exact matches? You mean why not just call it all distance? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's an under the hood thing related to supporting stuff besides just exact and distance. And probably it makes it clearer if you have exact written there, you'll understand what it means versus distance where you then have to go figure out. <coughs> oh no, that's distance zero. Uh, also, the other thing is um, in that other previous configuration, the way it's currently set up, and maybe this needs to evolve. Um, you specify on an attribute basis what distance you're willing to accept for that attribute. So it would probably be a little confusing to first do a distance zero and then do an exact. Uh, and then just generally, in terms of under the hood generating the SQL, for an exact match, it's going to be probably more efficient to just do a you know, select from where equals foo than to do select from where distance equals foo, which will fire off the, presumably will fire off the function under the hood that does the evaluation, which presumably uses more CPU time. On the other hand, it is a proof of concept implementation, so we can change all this. <laughs> Uh, so what kind of performance do we get out of this? So we just loaded our first round of test data. Uh, 30,000 real records represents the people whose last name begins with the letter A at Berkeley. Uh, so it's not going to be quite 26 times more than this, but it'll be you know, order of magnitude around that. And uh, what we ultimately saw after we fixed the problem with the disk filling up was that uh, we get about 85 milliseconds per record uh, based on our currently configured set of search uh, parameters, which are not actually terribly different than what we just saw on the other slide. Uh, the disk filling up thing was sort of interesting as a side note. Uh, it wasn't the match engine itself that was filling up the disk. It was logging from all over the place that filled up the disk. Uh, and, and once it got to about 90%, what we saw was periodically records would take two seconds instead of 85 milliseconds. Uh, so the moral of the story is don't let the disk get above 90%. Um, presumably, the operating system was doing something at that point that was uh, interrupting moving files around or whatever. Um, so that's, that was real data with about 30,000 records. We also have a 1 million record test database that we loaded using some fake data. Uh, and that one's actually accessible if people are interested in playing around with it. I can give out credentials to that one. Uh, and what we see with that one is with a, a similar query set, it takes between 700 milliseconds and three seconds to, per record to run, uh, which is actually roughly within our, our expectations and parameters for what we were planning out of this thing. Um, uh, it's not instantaneous, but given what it's doing, it's not that bad. Um, and these are just out of the box times with just stock VMs, uh, which you can see some of the parameters on there. What's interesting is our eight virtual CPU uh, VM and my MacBook Pro that's four years old uh, perform roughly the same. Um, so uh, that, that's just, again, out of the box, uh, Postgres with no real database tuning, and we're not running on any specialized reads or anything like that. Um, uh, the only thing we've done is create indexes on tables. 
And I highly recommend keeping those performance degrades rapidly if you get rid of the indexes uh, after you get past several hundred records. Uh, now that said, the actual performance numbers will vary um, according to how many attributes you define, what your confidence rules for them, how many of them are straightforward exact match rules versus fuzzy match rules. Uh, exact match rules means things that actually are, uh, are, are very, or basically can be done as, you can think of it in terms of like a hash lookup, right? So it's not necessarily exact string, but things like substring will also be an exact match uh, for performance reasons versus something, actually no, maybe not substring. Uh, well, it depends on which substring. Uh, versus something like fuzzy match, which is the distance uh, <coughs> matching, uh, which uh, can be significantly more costly to perform for pretty straightforward reasons. But one of the nice things about offloading this to a database engine is a database engine knows about all this stuff, and it can figure out how to optimize your queries for you so you don't have to. So for example, if your search queries include one exact match and then as many fuzzy matches as you want, the database will partition the search results, or it should, such that it runs the exact match first, gets candidates out of that, and then runs the fuzzy <coughs> matches. So instead of running fuzzy matches on a million records, it might run them on a thousand records. And you can imagine that's going to be a lot faster. Um, and this was the sort of thing we were trying to re-implement from scratch in our project last year, which when you build it on top of the database, you just kind of get for free. Uh, now that said, if you do searches of just fuzzy matches, it actually performs not awfully, uh, enough that you could contemplate it depending on how many records you've got coming in on what kind of rate. Um, uh, um, uh, to, for certain real life uh, scenarios. Uh, now, so we've got the, the demo, which we can do, which is actually pretty quick. Uh, we're actually almost at the top of the hour, so let me maybe just do a quick poll. Who wants to see the demo versus who wants to like go do a bio break or something? Demo? demo. Okay. So after the demo, there's like two more slides, so we might finish slightly late, but hopefully it won't be that bad. Uh, and there went the window. <laughs> Sorry, I just got to find the pointer. Okay. So uh, this is just, I'm using Chrome here, and I've got a, uh, a plugin in the browser that does uh, API queries. And so the first thing I'm going to do is a local uh, query against my database on this laptop, because there's a high probability of that working. Um, and so what this is, it's a put request where I've got, you can see here I've got a URL that looks like the one you saw before in the request, and this is for an HR person, and there's their system of record identifier. Um, we're sending over the name Neil Smith with a birth date of April 26th, but no year, and the last five digits of their SSN. Obviously, this is all fake data. Um, and so I'll hit send, and we'll, there's, a, by, oh, there's an authentication header that's been configured. It's just using basic auth. Uh, but you guys probably all know what that looks like, so we'll skip that. I send that across. Oh, perfect, internal server error. That's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, so let's try one of the external demos. Uh, this is um, another record. This one's against our million record database, so let's just fire that one off and hope it works. Uh, you'll notice this one takes a little bit long to respond. Get a response. Am I on the internet? All right, demo fail. Streak has ended. <laughs> um, that's sad. I should have tested it before. Yeah. Moral of the story is always test your. Sure, it's not sure it's what? No. Actually, you know, uh, oh, you know, they may be blocking port nine four four three. If that's the case, I can very quickly attempt to work around that, uh, and then when you all lose interest, uh, we'll give up. Uh, ooh, crap, why is it firing off Microsoft Word? That's not to speed things up. Bear with me for about 10 more seconds, <coughs> possibly a full minute if Microsoft Word really insists on starting with that. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, you know what it is? It's browser. It's the network time dev. Yeah, sorry. Let's click the button and see what happens. Uh, 
if anybody wants the free internet code. Alright, let's try that once more and hopefully this time it works. And, hey, there we go, success. So this was actually against, that was pretty fast actually. <laughs> that was against our million record database. And you can see here uh, I sent over the attributes from Patsy Stone. The date of birth was 1930 April 20th and the SSN was 1. And it comes back and says uh, 200 OK, I found a record that matched this. And it's, uh, the reference identifier is 2 million or whatever that is. You'll notice it's also repeated here because we reuse the reference identifier as our enterprise identifier, which is our system to system identifier. Um, and so in this example, it returns them both. I think this is basically the same type of query, but you'll see multiple choices here. So it'll take a little bit longer to run. This will all run through again here. This one took about three seconds. Um, and you can see here, this is what it looks like to get a couple of different candidates back. Um, uh, where there is a guest and uh, another guest thing there. And so these are potential candidates for the person. Uh, so that was the demo. We'll call that a partial success. And uh, from there, uh, we'll just skip that. Let me just, if you all don't mind staying for another minute, we'll just wrap this up. Um, so, uh, so this is our, our, basically our deployment plan here is kind of a lightweight deployment, which is part of the guest management system that was discussed uh, earlier today. Uh, we'll do some more testing. We're going to continue loading our existing data and vetting the results. We've already found a couple things that we've needed to tweak. Uh, and then our actual deployment strategy is we've got this thing called the sync code, which is our existing registry-like thing that's not a registry. It does matching itself. Our plan is to replace the sync code with a new registry product. So what we'll do is we'll modify the sync code to actually call out to this ID match engine instead of doing its own thing. Um, once that's done, eventually we'll deploy a new registry. And then the new registry will talk to the ID match engine, and that'll allow us to run both in parallel without having to worry about a flag day, which is pretty nice. Presumably they get the same set of attributes. Whoever sends them in first will cause the identifier to get created. Whoever calls in second will get the same identifier back. That's the plan. We'll see how that actually works. Uh, and then for the software itself, uh, so we'll probably do an 0.9 release, i.e. a tag, and then just keep going, um, which will basically deal with issues that come out of our functional testing round. Um, and then as we figure out what it's going to look like to go to production, there'll be another set of issues that come out. We'll call that a 1.0 release. And then after that, we'll see what happens in terms of roadmap and adding new features. Uh, definitely interested in the internationalization stuff that we talked about before, but we don't really have a good data set or a concept for that. Uh, so we definitely look for assistance there. And of course, like all open source projects, we always plead for help from whoever wants to, so that applies here as well. And finally, the URLs, uh, Bob URLs. So that first one is to the Cypher ID Max strongman, which talks about the protocol and our proposal for it. And then the second thing is the code base. So this is all open source code that you can download now. Um, I wouldn't recommend using it for production, but it's good enough to play around with. Um, and it's BSD licensed. There's the B, you may guess Berkeley, so they tend to like us to BSD <laughs> license things. Um, uh, basically, the short version was if we licensed under BSD, we could do pretty much whatever we wanted as quickly as we wanted. Anything else is going to take time. Um, and so that's there now. Uh, we are over on time, but I'm happy to answer any questions or um, whatever other random side discussion folks want to have. So thank you. So when you guys are moving this into production, do you plan to run it against, run the database against its own database to try to identify duplicates that have, are already in your your so, C database, if you will. So that's that may happen, but it's probably not a primary goal. Probably because I think it, I don't want to say that our current data is perfect, but there are a fair number of let's say resolution issues that happen already. So we tend to find out relatively quickly when there's bad data, but that doesn't mean certainly that we've caught it all. Um, and it, it may be worth having a conversation around whether or not we actually want to go ahead and do that. Um, Partly, I think we'll we'll see what happens just with our initial test loading of the database, and if lots of stuff starts to shake out that doesn't make sense, then we may end up needing to do that more more strongly. Okay. So the Levenshtein matching algorithm that you mentioned is that 
I don't quite remember. Is that an extension to Postgres that was developed by somebody, or is that part of Postgres? Um, I, I don't remember. I want to say I'm fuzzy on who uh, <laughs> on who developed it. It ships as part of the Postgres distribution. So if you download the the source, for example, it's in the full distribution. But in order to actually build and install it, you type make world instead of make. Um, and then if you're doing a packaged install, typically I think it's packaged separately. So depending on your distribution, there's probably a world, or or maybe it's just packaged as a separate model. The reason I ask is because if it seems like a good significant portion of handling that particular requirement is handed off to a database that may decide at some point to drop that particular behavior or feature. And with that, it would negatively affect the DR match quite a bit. Right. So if they decided they were going to stop supporting that, that would be an issue. But you know, you have that with any library or any other sort of code base that you're dependent on. Um, and the nice thing, of course, hey, it's open source, so we'll at least have the last version where it worked. And if we really need to go down that path, maybe we have to take on maintaining it as an external module or something like that. Or move to my stuff. Right. Which already has it in that state anyway. All right. Well, thanks, everyone.